Hi, this is Lee David Slotar. I created MacGyver, so in a way, I kind of created making fun of MacGyver too. So you're welcome, and I'm sorry. Tonight, MacGyver and Jack are stuck caring for an abandoned baby while looking for the mother who is on the run from counterfeiters. Will Sam and Jeff fall in love with this version of two men and a baby? Find out next on Making Fun of MacGyver. It's Making Fun of MacGyver, a rib tickling takedown of our favorite 80s adventure show, 321 Contact. Now, it's MacGyver, starring Sam Jordan as the skeptic and Jeffrey Hess as the scientist. Name's MacGyver. Welcome, everybody, to Making Fun of MacGyver. It's the show where we recap, review, and lovingly ridicule every episode of the original series. I'm Sam Jordan, your host, and as usual, I'm joined <laughs> I'm joined by my fellow MacGyverite, the only father in this bunch, in this fun bunch, Jeffrey Hess. Is this episode about counterfeit babies? <laughs> Oof, I hope not. Yeah. But that's a question for me. I, Jeff, I've got a question for you. An honest question, really. I've thought about this and I've wrote it out. Are you prepared to see more uncomfortable toddlers than an Easter Bunny photo session at Sears circa 1988? I didn't think it could get any better than those photos, but we're about to find out. <laughs> Good, uh, because we're moments away from making fun of MacGyver. It's our 82nd episode, the 62nd episode of MacGyver we have consumed. And it's, uh, we're talking about season three, episode 18 Rock the cradle. Rock the cradle. Yeah, a little, little, little Billy Idol there. But first, it's our opening gambit. All right, off to a good start. Uh, Jeff, we like to occasionally, as you know, thank the people who listen to the show and engage with us on social media because, one, it warms our hearts. That's the big one. Uh, two, it also helps us pick up a few extra listeners and downloads here and there. It really does. So let's do that now. I've got a few j names here, Jeff, and I want your help on one section. But uh, these are a few names that I've noticed over the past month or so. They look new to me. I don't know if they're new, but I think we got 236 Facebook followers and about 135 Twitter followers, and YouTube is coming up on 600. Um, but so thank you to Michael W. in Malaysia, Jordan K. in Ottawa. How about that? How about that Canada connection, Jeff? I'm, What's the day? <laughs> I mean, well, the, the show filmed seven or five seasons of the seven seasons there, so clearly the Canadians are very possessive of uh, things that are Canadian. <laughs> now they don't stay there. I know you said five or seven because you you know you are not totally familiar with the whole canon, but I watched the whole series a couple of years ago. Um, the last one or two seasons, I can't remember if it's two or one, but I think it's two. They're back in L.A. Really? Yeah. So they do like a two. Three, two, like a uh, NBA, yeah, NBA finals format yeah. <laughs> or old school. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, Stephen B. Stephen B. Not sure where you live, Stephen, but if you or if you have any mu musical talent. But based on your Facebook photo, Stephen, I would hire you to play at my wedding. So there's that. Appreciate it, Alan J. Alan, thank you for your service in the Marines. Uh, Corey N. in Ventura, California. Congrats on your Nuggets. Now, we're saying this, the Nuggets are up 3-1. I'm assuming they're going to win. Oh, yeah. They're dominant. The NBA Finals. Yes, yeah, they're absolutely dominant right now. And Corey N. is a Nuggets fan, it looks like. So, congrats. Uh, Stephen B. in Escutney, Vermont. Now, Stephen, based on the uh, Back to the Future and Dukes of Hazard photos on your profile, uh, you should probably get in touch with our friend Mike Garland. Cream me again. We can give you his number or go back and find that episode where he actually said his number on the podcast. <laughs> And uh, oh, and thank you for the share. Stephen B took it a step further. He actually shared, you know, the post from a few weeks ago, uh, the Mask of the Wolf one. So we really pre uh, appreciate that. Carly S in South Bend, Indiana. Carly was at Steel City Con in April to meet RDA and Richard Dreyfus and Mike Garland. And we know because she's got the photo there of her meeting Richard Dreyfus. And then uh, last one, Ali in Paimo, Finland. 
You want to talk about the the Canadian connection, Jeff? What what's up with this? Uh, what's it called again? What's the Scandinavian Nordic? The Nordic our connection to the Nordic countries is strong. We have like a heart mild with these people. And this guy, he studied at Talo Kiknikan Perustu Kitninto at Kaiplan Amantitispito. Oh, that's where he studied. You know, I almost went there instead of a uh, UCF in Orlando. Yeah, uh, I mean, for short, we call it TP at KA. So, I mean, that's mm. what at least people who know how to pronounce that, like me. Definitely say it like that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not that you were going slow because you were just reading it. You want to give each consonant well, its weight. I'm aware that only about 30% of our audience speaks Finnish. So for the other <laughs> 70%, I'm, I'm slowing it down so they can like go to their Finnish to English or Spanish or whatever other language, you know, or Finnish to like actually appropriately spoken Finnish. Well, they, they teach him well there because he apparently understands English quite well and listens to our show and enjoys it. So that's all you really need in a, some higher education. But uh, a big thank you to everyone we mentioned there. Welcome to the show. Uh, we really appreciate your support. And um, overall, we would love it if anyone out there has not subscribed to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers before we die. And if you do, actually, this just in, this bulletin, uh, four out of five dentists say you will reduce plaque and gingivitis by up to 90% by just subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's, it's making fun of MacGyver on YouTube. Jeff, looking around, what, what, what's going on there, Jeff? Uh, it, sounds, it sounds like half of my house just collapsed on itself, but I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old, so really anything could be going on right now. <laughs> okay. uh, I also want to well, point out, in case you didn't know this, here's a fun fact, the word halitosis is not a medical term. It was invented by the company Listerine to sell their breath freshening uh, liquids. They used mm. to sell it door to door, but they had a problem telling people they would go door to door to, you have bad breath. So they invented a pseudoscientific term called halitosis. Oh, wow. So they would go and you wouldn't say, hey, this will fix your nasty ass breath from all those Vicodin and martinis you're taking at 9 a.m., Mrs. Martin. It uh, is because of halitosis. We'll clear your halitosis. Does it MacGyver? <laughs> He's the scientist, folks. He's the scientist. Appreciate that. Oh, and if you want to throw something in the tip jar and get the perks that come with it, go to patreon.com slash making fun of MacGyver. Let's open up that viewer mailbag. You know who is a, uh, you know who's a very lucky man, Jeff? Uh, the husband of Claire Fisher. I don't think we know his name, but let's just call him, I don't know, Bobby. We'll call him Bobby Fisher. And if you were to go searching for Bobby Fisher, you'd have to look for the helpers, as Mr. Rogers said, because Claire Fisher is a helper indeed. She helped us out in a dazzling way this week. Um, now, you, you'll recall last episode, I opined that it would be interesting. We had a brief chat last episode, Mask of the Wolf, where I thought it'd be interesting to see a statistical breakdown of every MacGyver plot, mainly like what person or event was the main cause of the conflict, because... Remember back to season one, Mac worked to the Phoenix Foundation. He still does. But every week he's being sent on a new assignment. He's going there. He's globe trotting. He's in Germany, all these made up countries. And he's like a secret agent. That formula, though, seems to have been forgotten by producers because more often than not, it's like Jack Dalton needs a favor or he, he's, he's caught in a supermarket, something over, you know, a, a woman runs up to him on the street. I'm pregnant. <laughs> help. What is going on here with these plots? I just thought it would be great to see a statistical breakdown of how Matt Mac gets involved in all these hijinks. So we talked about that and we published that uh, in episode 81 on Wednesday, June 7. OK, the next day, June 8, Claire Fisher sends us a color coded pie chart <laughs> labeled MacGyver's plots by inciting factor sorting through 139 or the 141 episodes and putting the conflict causes in 10 separate categories, my mind was blown. And that this took only a day is miraculous because she's got like a bunch of different categories on here. My favorite of which is dictators and enemy nations. That's a pretty epic well, category. Meddlesome um, friend who's there's oh. both Jack Dalton and then other meddlesome friends. <laughs> so he's got like two different categories. There's like the Jack plots and then there's just other friends who get him in trouble. All right, let's look at this list for a second, but but she also sent us a voice mail, voice a uh, voice memo. So let me play her cut and let's look at the the pie chart and we'll come back and discuss. 
Inspired by your discussion, I went through my notes from MacGyver, as well as the plot synopses on IMDb and the blog called The MacGyver Project, which uh, is a few years old now, but ranked all of the episodes and also included summaries and trivia and interviews and that kind of thing. So I ran through them and I kind of broke it all down by, uh, is MacGyver assigned to do this job? Like, did the Phoenix Foundation send him out for this? Or was it that he got a call from Jack or a call from Penny or some other friend? Um, or was it some sort of natural disaster like in Trumbo's world? world, world? Or uh, is it something where he is just a bystander and he's decided to take it on himself to solve the problems of the world? And of course, we had to create other categories for Murdoch and so forth. Now, you might notice that things don't add up exactly to the number of episodes because there are certain two-parters with only one problem. There are certain episodes with multiple problems, such as when Murdoch and Penny Parker meet up. And there are a handful of episodes that are framed as dream sequences, which really don't have any problems at all, aside from whatever the screenwriters were trying to say about Mac's mental health. So, yeah, that's basically my methodology. I hope you enjoy the chart, and... um, let me know if you have any questions. Keep on making fun of MacGyver. Yeah, and there's like a there's the birthday episode from season two where there's like it's all cutbacks. So I mean, how do you even quantify that? But I just what a, a tremendous job. First, before we go over this chart, let's thank her again, who we just met like two years ago. She just like wrote us on Twitter. It's like, hey, you guys have a MacGyver podcast. I actually watched the whole series and took you know, notes on how many girlfriends got killed. And anyway, so and we, we've become very good friends uh, with Claire. Consider her a good friend. And uh, Dead Fictional Girlfriends Report is her site. Uh, so check out Dead Fictional Girlfriends Report. But now let's look at this list, Jeff. And I see the pie chart. It's split up into 10 categories. Walk me through. Let's start with the, the and this is MacGyver plots by inciting factor. In other words, what's the source of the conflict? And she breaks it down. So let's start with the most common. These are split at 28.8%. So about a third, 60% of your episodes are either going to be assignment or bystander intervention. (laughs) Now, bystander intervention could be anything from he runs across a pregnant lady who's being chased by the mob. Like that's a really broad category. Mm -hmm. But there are so many times that he just like stumbles into insane things. So 60% of it is that. And then another 10-ish percent is from either Jack or Penny. You have about 5% from Murdoch, and then the remainder are forces of nature. I guess that'd be the avalanche episode, right? Where he was skiing. Mm-hmm. Well, she's got criminals at 12% there. Do you see criminals a, 12%? There's a lot of criminals in the world of MacGyver. Yeah. This is a yeah. criminals episode. Uh, yeah. It's also a Jack episode. Yeah, it's also it's a, a bystander intervention episode. Yeah. <laughs> so I get what she's saying about how yeah. like they don't quite, it's not like you can't just slot it into one. But I still got to say, I think my favorite category is dictators and enemy nations. <laughs> I, just because of the way that it's named. I love this concept of like MacGyver's take, single-handedly taking down entire dictators and enemy <laughs> nations. But just miraculous work. Truly terrific. No, no. Thank you so much, Claire. It's really interesting. And we will post this on our social channels, um, you know, after the episode airs. So look for that. It's really cool. Interesting to see that. But if I would have said to you or any MacGyver fan, what is the source of MacGyver's adventures and conflict? What? Well, they're like he works for the Phoenix Foundation and he goes to other countries to or whatever. But according to this chart, that's only 29% of the action he gets into is an actual assignment. Bystander intervention is the same amount. I mean, I don't know if I feel it that way at this point, but of course we're only almost done with season three and she's counting all the episodes. So I think that says we can expect a lot more bystander <laughs> intervention coming up. I don't, I don't know. At this point, I would have guessed like maybe 20% of the episodes are him being sent on assignment. It seems mm-hmm. like pretty uncommon at this point. Mm-hmm. But uh, thank you so much, Claire. Very cool. Go to Dead Fictional Girlfriends Report. And uh, nobody, <sighs> nobody does... Feminist TV <laughs> scrutiny better than Claire Fisher. And it's so cool well, she's got her own uh, niche. And I'll make this quick because this is an aside, but one that Claire I think will appreciate when she hears it. Uh, there's this like series of detective movies that have come out. Kenneth Brenow is done as Hercule Poirot. You've got Daniel Craig as Benoit Blanc. And I just watched uh, Christian Bale's The Bluest Eye where he plays a detective in it. All three of those guys have dead wives. Mm. I th- like get announced at like the start of the film. Daniel Craig's doesn't even make the show. It's just like, oh yeah, his wife is dead. 
but mm-hmm. to outdo his other competitive uh, male grizzled private eyes in the 1800s detectives, he's got a dead daughter too. Man, they just these men really need their dead wives and dead daughters <laughs> for motivation. Or else, what are they gonna do? Just solve crimes like some chumps? It keeps Claire Fisher and Dead Fictional Girlfriends Report in business, right? We don't want it to just be 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s TV shows now. They're still churning out, so that's awesome. Uh, Let me take you back now, Jeff, to Monday, April 18th, 1988. That's the year here. The number one movie in the country is Beetlejuice. Oh, yeah. fantasy horror comedy by Tim Burton, directed by Tim Burton, starring Alec Baldwin, Gina Davis, Jeffrey Jones, Catherine O'Hara, Winona Ryder, and Michael Keaton. As Beetlejuice, the plot revolves around a recently deceased couple who, as ghosts haunting their former home, contact Beetlejuice, an obnoxious and devious bio-exorcist from the netherworld to scare away the house's new inhabitants. What are your thoughts on Beetlejuice, Jeff? Uh, Well, first of all, I used to watch this movie, and especially he had a television show that was on in the 90s, a cartoon that I watched unbelievable amounts of. But this is the first time that I'm actually understanding the premise of what Beetlejuice is. <laughs> it didn't occur to me that he was like a reverse exorcist. Like he was to me, he was always just Beetlejuice. And when you put the plot like that, oh, he's a bio. And then like all of a sudden it clicks. Oh, that's why he's doing all this stuff. You know, to me, he's kidding me. He was just like, oh, he's just like a like a puck like nefarious trickster. But no, he's actually got a job. Yeah, I never really thought about that much either. I just thought, oh, it's a vehicle for Michael Keaton to act silly and some wacky special effects, Tim Burton to do his thing. But uh, it's fine. I I think some people have really fond memories of it. Uh, I I consider it fine, but you were younger seeing it, so maybe you enjoy it a little bit more. Seems like it'd be on the, I would need to rewatch it to like update my Mm -hmm. opinion. It's been 20 something years, but I, yeah, I mean, particularly the the cartoon more so than the, than the movie. A cartoon I love. Cartoons are really fun. Was a critical and commercial success, grossed seventy four million dollars, the budget of only fifteen million, and it won an Oscar for best makeup. Now, we're, you know, we we like to be a current show too. We like to keep you updated on all the hot news. Not really. We play commercials from nineteen eighty five, but uh, a sequel was officially announced May tenth, twenty twenty three, just last month. I, I that news missed me, but it, Wikipedia says so, and it's coming out. I don't think they call it Beetlejuice two, but. A neck, another Beetlejuice movie scheduled for September 24. I wonder what they're calling it. Beetlejuicier? Yeah, when enough time goes by, you can just give it the same name and, you know, hey, it's a reboot. Yeah, yeah it's Beetlejuice 24. Uh, the number one song in the country is Get Out of My Dreams and Get Into My Car, a pickup line that I am currently 0 for 127 on, by the way. I love that um, you're keeping exact track. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, by Trinidadian British pop singer Billy Ocean. Apparently, it was based on a line in the Sherman Brothers song, Year 16. It was released as the first from Ocean's seventh studio album, Tear Down These Walls. Part of its popularity lay in its cutting edge for the time. Music video, which features animation mixed with live action sequences. And um, yeah, Get Out of My Dreams. You know that song, Jeff? I do. Get out of my dreams. That's a little appetizer because yep. I am going to. I don't want to step on your toes. This is your week. <laughs> yeah. It uh, became it was Ocean's third and final U.S. number one single. Now I know his first one was probably Caribbean Queen. I was sharing the same dream. So what was the oh, second yeah. one though? Ba-da-ba, oh, was it when the... That's right. We had to remind you of that a couple of years ago. You didn't know that, and we had to remind you. But I think maybe when the going gets tough, the toughs gets going. If I had to think of his third number one, I don't know. Yeah. But those are two very good good songs. I do like the other chart where it hit, which was Hot Black Singles. I'm a big fan of the Hot Black Singles chart. <laughs> yes. yes. And uh, oh, did you know this fun fact? The title of the song was actually changed at the last minute by producers. It was originally going to be called Get Out of My Dreams, Get on the Back of My Moped, uh, in parentheses, if you can fit. Yeah, that's a good change. I support that change. Yeah. Let me just uh, turn the keys on this car here. Let me get it started up. As long as it can start. There we go. Yes, you. Get into my car. <laughs> Come on, guys. Support me on this. Let's go. Number 23. We're Jeff's GT. Golf or whatever. Got the top down. 
Who's that lady coming down the road? Who's that lady? Who's that woman walking through my door? What's the score? I'll be the sun shine on you. Hey, Cinderella, step in my shoe. I'll be a non-stop lover. Get it while you can. Your non-stop miracle. I'm your man. Get out of my dreams. Get into my car. Get out of my dreams. Get in the back seat, baby. Get into my car. Get into the mama. Get into my life. Oh, here we go. Oh, I said, hey, you get into my car. Oh boy, <laughs> what a voice! <laughs> like not even really, not really asking, like commanding, almost like while you're shaking with a can of pepper spray and a pistol. Yeah. Hey, you. Hey, you. Get into my car. Yep. I think the, the only thing it needs is like is a now at the end of it. Get into my car now or mm-hmm. else. Yep. If you know what's good for you, get into yeah. my car. If you want to see the puppies, they're in the car. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I've destroyed that song. Sorry, Billy Ocean. And sorry, listeners. But now <clears throat> we're all set. The, the table is set for the main course, which, as you know, is MacGyver. It's Monday. It's uh, April 18th, uh, 8 o'clock that night. It's ABC the network it's macgyver season three episode 18 just a few more left in season three and it's uh rock the cradle, rock the cradle and now i hand over the reins of the show to the next level of macgyver narrators the gentleman jeffrey hess well if you like jack dalton you're in luck because it's another jack dalton episode and we begin with jack and mac in the air i have this recurring nightmare i'm on a game show and the hundred thousand dollar question is What's the opposite of Swiss air? And before I can think, I answer, Dalton Airways. Jack Dalton's dream, my nightmare, and at the moment, we were both living it. He had picked up this lame duck at a drug enforcement auction in Mexico, at a bargain basement price, of course. Even drug dealing desperados draw the line on what they'll fly, but not Jack. Oh no. Come on, be good to Papa. She's got a little temperamental, isn't she? Come on, baby, be nice to Papa. Jack, we've lost one engine! Yeah, well, we still got one engine. So Jack's plane is a piece of junk, and of course it immediately breaks. Uh, and the landing gear won't lower. you got to have landing gear to land on, and it's it's stuck up. I'm stuck up about Jack Dalton being in another damn episode. What? How are you going to double up on Jack Dalton? We just had Jack Dalton. No, don't do that. Is that five on the season? I don't know. Yeah, well, the two-parter in the beginning of the season. Yeah. That's at least. But no, don't go back to back, Jacks. <laughs> you know, I was watching it, and I feel like Bruce McGill told us at some point in our interview with him that, like, they were trying to give RDA some like rest and ended oh, okay. up bringing him in more frequently than maybe they had initially expected because they were just running poor Richard into the ground. Okay. So yeah, maybe, maybe out that, of necessity, maybe that has something to do with it, but it also gives us an opportunity for our first and only does it MacGyver right at the beginning of the episode, because MacGyver slaps on a parachute like a King and goes to fix this landing gear. Now, he gets back there, and it's spewing hydraulic fluid all over the place. Whatever the fluid that's supposed to pump these uh, landing gear down has broken. So, here we go. Does it MacGyver? He grabs a canister of air, some kind of air, and then climbs, clambers down onto the uh, landing gear, hooks the air up to where the hydraulic hose would be, and then releases the air, and that releases the landing gear. So, airplanes do use retractable landing gear to to reduce drag in flight. These are very common, uh, and they've been on the planes for a really long time. Typically, these are hydraulic, electronic, or sometimes manual. So hydraulic is with fluid. Pneumatic is with air. This is kind of an important distinction. Um, I found a a website run by a a Swedish pilot that says occasionally 
airplanes will have backup pneumatic systems to lower the landing gear, but usually it's hydraulic systems, which would be a problem for MacGyver because pneumatic air can't, it can be compressed. The reason hydraulic systems work is because water and liquid cannot be compressed. And so when you press on it, that's what makes it happen. Mm. Uh, that's the same way your brakes work on your car or I don't know, you know, anything else that's hydraulic. That's okay. how it works because liquids can't be compressed. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would think I'm about to tell you that this does not work. And once again, mm-hmm. that they all die because it's mm-hmm. air, right? You would be quite wrong because this is a Douglas DC-3, okay. a very popular airplane that was built for about 20 years from the 30s to the early 50s. Okay. And I found a copy of the original service manual that someone had <laughs> scanned and loaded onto the internet. And in it are instructions on what to do in case of failure of the hydraulic lowering gear. And you don't even need the gas. They go down on their own. It says, and I'm quoting here, the gear will extend under its own weight. If you pull the nose up sharply on the plane, it'll lock the gear into place. So I'm going to say that since MacGyver was standing on that landing gear, that is the pressure needed to unlock it. The gas, totally superfluous. But MacGyver's weight itself, the size of his glorious mullet, standing on that weighted gear is enough to free it and lock it. It swings into place, and Mac drops out into the into the clear air. He falls out of the plane. Uh, a couple things, though. I, I hate to start a story, and then we've got like tons of info to stop the story. But according to IMDb, when MacGyver's not according to IMDb, according to my eyes, when MacGyver's trying to fix the landing gear, we can see the plane is flying over a city complete with streets and houses. When MacGyver's hanging, that is the green screen or whatever they used back then effect underneath him. That is, he's obviously not hanging over. Streets and houses, then when Mac parachutes out, they are suddenly over a very rural location back there in, in Vancouver or wherever. So that's one. But then on this plane, DC, it says the DC-3 that was used for Dalton Air was later on a flight from Playa Grande when it crashed on um, November 1st, 1998 into mountainous terrain near Quetzalinango Airport. Doesn't say where that is, and I'm sure I destroyed that That name, thing was still flying in the 90s? Instrument meteorological conditions, thick fog and rain prevailed, and no flight plan was reported filed. The bad weather was due to the tropical depression. Mitch, the plane carried doctors from the Christian Agua Viva missionary group who had done medical relief work in Playa Grande. Doesn't talk about who died, but I assume they all died, so rest in peace there. But that's what happened to the plane. It's not surprising that a group like that would be flying in a junky old plane with Mm. no flight recorded. Mm. I mean, they they are being in the same situation Jack is, and they probably bought it for cheap. I mean, cheap, 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 cheap. These planes were built in the 30s. Oh, we had some chickens in here for a second. Um, Cheap, 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 cheap. What? uh, How about this, though? What about the shot with the one engine, the one propeller not going? How do they do that? That was a really nice shot up there. So they're in another plane sitting right now. And that was a really nice on Paramount HD. They look good. That was a nice shot up in the air with the natural light. How did they do that shot? I, I, well, I mean, a plane is going to coast for some period of time after you lose your, your forward thrust. So you can probably just turn it off for the 30 or 40 seconds that they need. And then your momentum is still going to carry you forward. Wow. Okay. But I, I agree with you about, um, about the quality of the opening of this shot. I was, I, and they even took the time to like paint Dalton Airways on the side. I like of it. that. Like they, I like they that got touch. the details. Yep. Um, that was nice. I did notice a bit of a directorial boost from this episode. I think whoever was in charge of directing it did a pretty good job here because there are some other elements that I'm going to talk about that I think. Oh, yeah. Really there's well. a weird thing that comes up later. Uh, hopefully I can remember. I don't know if I'll remember, but I'll get you that director in a second. Go ahead. So since he went 0 for 1 last week and he's only got one this week, I'm going to give it to him because of his big fat tuchus opening the gear and we'll say that okay. this does MacGyver but if you're ever in a DC3 and the and the gear won't go down they'll fall of their own weight if you just lift up on the nose Michael um, Vihar V Vihar V E J A R Michael Vihar directed this one Good job Well Mac lands safely and Jack also lands safely so they both he crashes to earth in his parachute and Mac and Jack lands his plane and Jack of course is thrilled He's like, we've defeated the gods. We've survived the impossible. And MacGyver is furious again because he's like, why do I keep doing this? Every single episode Jack is in, he's constantly wondering aloud why he's friends with Jack. But he is. 
we cut to a nearby officers club that would have been used f- like as you know like naval air officers or air mm-hmm. force officers or whatever got to blow off some steam yeah with alcohol um and we see two men who we later find out are cutler and durst i don't know which one's cutler and which one's durst <laughs> oh boy please tell me they're not going to challenge stupens and marlin i was going to make the, i was going to make the joke that this is like Stu- this is Steubens and Marlowe like in the past and they get older Ooh. in the future and then like okay. anyway okay. so uh, Cutler and Durst are counterfeiting money and they're trying to find a way to move this money and they need paper is the last thing that they're looking for but they go to check their sample bills and all of their other counterfeit money and the plates have been stolen from them hmm. at that same time a waitress on the on the floor goes in the back room and she finds a baby and a man named Carlo and Carlo is saying, hey, girl, we got to get out of town. We got all this fake counterfeit money. We can bail out of here and then we'll be fine. But they are not fine because they get immediately uncovered. And Cutler or Durst, one of them, <laughs> shoots and kills Carlo right in front of Katie, who flees with the baby as Cutler and Durst try to find her, but they cannot. Now, Katie is on the run with the baby. Carlo is dead. And Jack and Mac have survived the impossible. We cut to the boat house, the boat house where... Uh, Jack is waking up Mac and trying to get him to come along on an actual, he swears, this time legitimate order, but uh, he needs MacGyver to help him repair the plane. Mac agrees again because he always I'm really tired of this. I'm really tired of RDA, you know, making RDA have to be grumpy about Jack. I mean, it's just, it's a tired bit, you know? Yeah. If If you're that upset about it, you should take Pete's advice and stop hanging out with the guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, But anyway, they go to work on the plane, and lo and behold, there is a baby inside of the plane. And that is the end of Axminster 1. We begin Axminster 2, and Jack and Mac are debating what the heck to do about this baby that they have just found. Inside of the little crib thing that this baby is in is a letter, and it says, Dear Jack, this is Jack Jr. And the letter asks Jack to take care of this baby. Jack is claiming to MacGyver that he has no idea who this woman is that could be claiming this is his Mm -hmm. baby. But in classic Jack Dalton fashion Mm -hmm. and is highlighted well by the director because the right side of his face is in dark and the left side of his face is in light. You see his left eye twitching like crazy and Mac says, I know you're lying. Who are you calling? Social services. We need an abandoned baby pickup. Jack Jr. This is yours, isn't it? No. Look, I may have inspired a namesake, but I sure as hell didn't sire one. Oh, yeah? Then who's Katie? Who knows? I mean, do I have to take responsibility for every woman I can't remember who can't forget me? No, I do not. You're lying, Jack. Your eye's twitching. I don't know any Katie. Well, I don't remember her. Jack? We met at the officer's club. She plied me with mezcal. It lasted about a week. It was well over a year ago. I don't even remember if I had a good time. Don't try to con your old bachelor friend, Jack. Who's con and who? Look, this is a problem for social services. Let the police find the mother. It's not our problem. Our only problem is a plane that has to fly by morning, and we can't stand around babysitting. Up until this episode, I had never thought about or tried to picture Jack Dalton having sex. Oh, it's all I think about. (laughs) Well, for me, this was my first time, um, because you're forced to think of Jack having unprotected sex. So. I don't know how you could look at that mustache and not think about sex. <laughs> if you're a woman or many men, apparently. Yeah. So uh, uh, I do want to point one thing out as the baby haver of the group. The timeline of when he met her and how old this baby is doesn't match up. Because yeah. this baby is like a year old, maybe nine months, For 15 sure. months, yeah. somewhere in that range. He's like, I met her a year ago. It still takes 10 months to have a baby. <laughs> and so the baby should only be two or three months old. <clears throat> but anyway... They go to tend to the baby, and that's when they find not just the fake money, but also the fake plates, the fake ca- the currency plates that mm-hmm. are like the, the center of this. Um, meanwhile, Katie goes to ask a friend for some help, and the friend says, take some money and leave, which Katie agrees to do. Um, Jack and Mac are still struggling to figure out what to do with this baby. Um, and they're like fighting and bickering and jack was supposed to get diapers and he got beer and chips instead good choice jack (laughs) and then the best part of the episode happens jack is holding on to this baby his baby reaches out and grabs like some kind of tchotchke on a on a shelf next to jack and it Mm -hmm. starts like an eight piece (laughs) 
<laughs> domino effect. Like the lamp falls and it hits a, a Rube Rolodex. Goldberg yeah, machine. and then like cards pop out of the Rolodex. That hits a beer and it spills. And beer it was on, in slow motion. And it spills beer on the on the keyboard and the whole computer explodes into flames. It was just like. I don't know, uh, a Quentin Tarantino movie for something or so. Like where MacGyver's doing slow motion with a Rube Goldberg machine for some reason, but okay, it was interesting. Yep, it's Michael amazing. Uh, Katie later, uh, Jack later explains that you know, okay, so Katie left me for this Carlos guy, which is an upgrade because Carlos is better looking than Jack is. You know, but that's <laughs> a, that's not the point. Um, and this is the point where the they find the mates, the plates, and the money, and they decide we got to go to Pete. So they head over to Pete at the Phoenix Foundation, and he says, this this is so impressive. These counterfeits are amazing. All they're missing is the paper that they would need to print these on. You'd be totally fooled. Uh, and Pete says, you know, the IRS reported the plates lost, and one of their employees was found dead a couple weeks ago. All, this, all the pieces are lining up now that they've found a counterfeiting operation. But what they have found with their noses is a big old stinky diaper. <laughs> and these three men... Try to change this one baby's diaper in classic 1980s men don't know what to do with babies fashion. And Pete himself, like the baby swaddled in duct tape, like they duct taped a towel to him. And, and Did they? Pete I is, didn't notice the duct tape. Oh, it's in the clip. Pete's okay. not impressed. What's the ripping sound? MacGyver's duct tape. Oh, boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are pathetic. You know that? Where did you learn to diaper a baby? In a fish market? Now look out. Here, let me show you. Here. Oh, boy, you don't even know how to fold a diaper. Look at that. <laughs> you know, you're right, Pete. This looks like a job for an experienced father. We're going to check out the club where she works. No place for a kid that age. Come back here. You're not going to leave me here alone with him. <laughs> Guess they did, huh? complete with 80s goofy music uh they do they ditch pete with the baby another thing i didn't ever think about uh until this episode i didn't think i'd ever be confronted with uh full frontal male nudity like i was in this episode so the um the baby played by two twins i don't know if you noticed that in the opening credits but malcolm fairweather and fraser fairweather play jack jr because you're not going to keep one uh, but anytime they cut to that kid both of those kids were not happy about being held by jack or whoever was holding them they were never smiling and having fun for the most part except for the end uh, and that probably took like a lot of fruit loops but one of those actors oh well, i guess they're not really an actor anymore i don't know but can say like yeah i my junk was on an episode of macgyver in 1988 because it, it, it's a Brief shot, but when Pete is changing the diaper, it's I'm surprised, but they went with it, and it's fine. It's tough because the babies need to be older so you can work with them. But like once they hit about six months, they hit stranger danger zone. So like oh, right. you, your right. young, young children will let anybody hold them. But time they hit six, seven months, they are not letting anyone touch them. And yeah. so it's not a surprise to me that they're these babies are very upset throughout the process of this. If Pete's going to give these guys a hard time about diapers, he doesn't know how to fold them either because he folded the towel in thirds. Diapers are folded in like a triangle pattern. Mm. I mean, is not is this not obvious? You want them to be like to look like underwear or a bathing suit or something like that. And so like you fold its triangle in the back and then straight in front and you flip it and then you would like pin it to the front. D does Pete's changing Jack Jr.'s diaper. Does it MacGyver? Does it Pete Thornton? No, <laughs> okay. no. I, I mean, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Mac and Jack did better with the duct tape than pete was doing <laughs> and of course like it cuts right as pete's calling the secretary so like pete himself isn't exactly doing a lot of work here but another secretary by the way pete pete goes through those secretaries it's a I lively think. debate among uh well i guess more affluent parents right now as to whether or not go back to uh reusable diapers or continue to use disposable diapers now the disposables are miraculous in what they can do but they're also horribly polluting because you only use them the one time. And if they get in the sewage system, they can get what's called like a diaper berg. It's like a, it's like an iceberg in the <laughs> sewer pipe. It's just all diapers. Oh and gosh. they have to like use huge machines to push these things out. They're a big problem, but they just work so well. And they're super easy. But anyway, if you're doing it, fold the thing like a triangle, not mm -hmm. like a, like a rectangle, mm -hmm. but they ditch the kid with Pete who then ditches the kid with a woman after boasting about his own skills. And Jack and Mac head to the club. 
You know, they know that the Officers Club, that's where Katie was. There's another waitress there. She's not giving them anything to go on. But Cutler and Durst recognize Jack Dalton from his previous engagement with Katie and figured that they're on to something. So back at the hangar, Jack and Mac are still working on the airplane because I guess that's their plan to still do this cargo run. Who knows? <laughs> but um, Cutler and Durst outside pull up and you see that they're armed. And that is the end of Axminster 2 on a cliffhanger. Mm. Good spot to end there. And um, good time for a time capsule commercial. We'll be back right after this. It's another unforgettable moment with making fun of McGavin. MacGyver, you did it! MacGyver! 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 <laughs> the emotional roller coaster of Trumbo's final, where he's excited MacGyver, skeptical MacGyver, sad MacGyver. That's like, a gif, right? Yeah. Get some audio on, on that, and that's like a gif you would always want to see. Keep listening for more finger quotes, unforgettable moments. MacGyver! On making fun of MacGyver. Legs that just won't give up. It's a feeling that really shows. She's a no nonsense kind of woman. She wears no nonsense pantyhose. No nonsense light support gives you that firm, toned up feeling all day at a very attractive price. She makes the most of her thing. She gives it all that she's got. She's one busy lady. Her legs never stop. No nonsense. Well, if the attitude fits, where it's. Oh my god, I love that so much. You're really enjoying this. Oh, she, she's a no-nonsense lady. She gives it all that she's got. <laughs> oh, you got to wear them no-nonsense pantyhose. Oh, my gosh. So I don't know what to me, make of that. Tell the viewers uh, what that commercial looks like for a light support pantyhose. Uh, it's a, a housewife kind of mom. Oh, it's definitely not a housewife because we're in the 80s. This is a woman in a power suit. So she's in like the, she's in like a business oh, right, suit yeah. with a skirt, and it keep like cutting to her legs as she's like, wrangling kids and like kicking a pop machine to get the pop to come out and like doing all groceries in her hands. She's very busy, but she's still got great legs. She's still got time for great legs with these pantyhose. Yes, because her legs never stop. She's giving it all that she's got. (laughs) Here's the big question I have for you, Jeff, and I really need you to think about this before you answer. What the hell happened to pantyhose? Dude, I was going to ask you the same question. (laughs) Uh, My guess is they fell onto the pile of useless garments. (laughs) <laughs> like what's the point i think more bank robbers buy pantyhose these days than women yeah you can also use them to like i've heard uh strain marijuana if you're trying to make um like oil to cook with pantyhose man as you know so i've got you by 12 or so years or whatever it is but i just remember pantyhose being such a big thing in, like the 70s and into the 80s and as a uh, you know pubescent teen with the hormones raging, right? L- women's legs are amazing to look at, and especially like you know you'd want to see like tan legs, right? For if it was a white woman, tan legs just catch your eye. So pantyhose are often colored to give a little bit of that tan. So from far away, you'd be like, oh, look at those legs, and then you get up closer, and it's like, oh, she's wearing pantyhose, and it was always a disappointment. And that's and that and uh, evil uh, gunmen robbing at banks is pretty much the only things at times I thought about pantyhose. But now women just don't wear them, and they're incredibly delicate. Like they can rip for basically no reason, and uh, like so. I mean, I can think of many reasons why they went the way of the dodo. I mean, women are allowed to wear pants now, which is a big thing. Like until fairly recently, it was frowned upon to women to wear pants, and just like just completely unnecessary. Mm. It's kind of like hats on men. I mean, what do you need them for? Yeah, you look at a baseball game from the 40s or 50s, every single man in the stands is wearing a bowler, some kind of hat, mm-hmm. you know, you had to do it. But, but I uh, appreciate the effort that the singer put into the song, that's for sure. <laughs> that guy's really going for it. Oh, I love it. Okay. It's like, this is my big break. I'm going to get on to the, what was it, the hot black singles chart. <laughs> and, and, oh, my, so, and of course, uh, that was our clip. That was the clip from Trumbo's oh. World World. So, of course, it's our most referenced episode and we love it. But when I was looking for like what really happened in that episode at the end, we had the we had a, a visit from Trumbo and that wasn't that funny or that great. And I was like, I don't know. Our ex- our episode of talking about it was not an amazing one to listen to. But hearing all the times when the, the dam bursts and MacGyver coming back, he, he killed the ants and Trumbo goes through all the stages of 
belief, disbelief, fear, exhilaration, and you love that, and I still love that too. Yeah, it's great. MacGyver! MacGyver! MacGyver? Oh no. <laughs> MacGyver! Anyway, I'll be my final. <laughs> and of course, as we said before, that is in the opening uh, intro, our music, you know, our theme Ma- song. Ma- that Ma- is Ma- Ma- MacGyver. Yeah, that's, uh, that's Trembo. Although I, until I just heard it there, I always thought it was you. Really? Because it sounds just like, yes, it oh sounds just like you. No. I didn't realize that was Trembo's world. It's that's David good. David Ackroyd. Are we ready for Axe Mr. 3? Let's do it. And not his first, is not his last appearance in MacGyver series either. Right. Because he was just in a couple episodes ago. Uh, So we begin Axe Mr. 3. Cutler and Durst are charging into the hangar, guns drawn. And they're demanding. And they have masks on. But like really weird plastic masks. Not Not, pantyhose. If they would have just used pantyhose, (laughs) they probably would have succeeded. Light support. Um, He's got an AK-47 and he knows how to use it. (laughs) (laughs) So they're demanding the baby. Because they're like, hey, we don't have the plates. We don't have the money. And they're like, screw it. We we want the baby because she's going to come get the baby. And uh, at that moment, MacGyver picks up his model airplane, his RC oh, model airplane, God. flies it into the air and oh. crashes it next to Cutler and Durst, causing an explosion oh, and great amount of fear, which buys <laughs> MacGyver just enough time to yell at Jack to start the plane and call the cops. MacGyver sprays, I guess, cleaning foam. Well, he just, Into the it was just a few episodes ago when he went nuts on the guys. He spewed his foam all over two guys yeah. and they couldn't take it anymore and they begged him to stop. I know. I mean, it just sprays all over them. It's in their face. It's in their clothes. It's on their feet. It's knocking them over. It's just a really powerful spray of foam. But MacGyver starting up a remote control plane that starts to head towards them and these two badasses with their guns duck and pretty much curl up in the fetal position oh boy i mean i think they would just like step aside or you know bat it away or shoot it but wow okay good job not even the first time that he attacks people with remote control plane because there's an episode in season one where he does that yep so anyway they flee because they heard that they're gonna call (laughs) the cops real tough guys um back at the phoenix foundation pete is saying that they really should take the baby to social services uh, because this is getting pretty dangerous. And Jack and Mac are deciding that, no, nah, we want to solve the case. So we got to find Katie. So they take a sky banner up. They get in another plane. I guess it's another plane. <laughs> and they fly a sky banner that reads, Jack needs his mama with a phone number. This gets them on the news. And Katie is later walking through alone, very 1980s Blade Runner style, <laughs> alone through the cold, quiet, dark by herself. And she walks by a, I guess these were common. A store with a bank of TVs yeah, out in front right. of it, and they happen to be playing the news. <laughs> with them. they're interviewing, they're interviewing Jack and Mac about why they're flying around with this banner. My my calves are actually sore from all the leaps of faith I need to do yeah, for this episode. It's it's pretty unbelievable. Um, and so that does prompt Katie to call Jack and Mac at the number, and they answer, and they set up a meeting place for her. And she tells them that, you know, they killed, she saw them kill Carlo, all this kind of stuff. Now, Katie is with Jack and Mac. At the same time, Cutler and Durst go to meet their paper supplier, who's going to give them the currency paper and uh, murder him. <laughs> as they have, because they murdered the, mm-hmm. the plates guy, too. So they're trying to clean up their tracks. But now, Cutler and Durst have everything they need except for the plates. And I guess, and the baby, and Katie. And <laughs> like, well, I guess they don't really have much of anything that they need. They have paper. <laughs> Uh, and that, believe it or not, is the end of Axminster 3. I believe it. I think, uh, listeners, Ax- if you're scoring along at home, I think you might be surprised if either of us come in with more than, say, a 6 or a 5 on this one. But Well, and we, for the first time, I think, a while, are going to have a real hard time with the like the most make fun of moment in this, because there are mm. many. Yeah. The Sky Banner is very funny. The Rube Goldberg Baby Machine is very funny. Uh, there's a, there's this, the foam spraying, like there's a lot of just goofball shit. So we start Axe Minister four and they're back at the houseboat once again. And they have learned about the paper man murder and Pete, Jack and Mac are finally starting to put all the pieces together about what's going on. Yeah. All right. Thanks. See ya. Well, another piece of the puzzle. A lot of your warehouse worker was found this morning off highway 26 ballistics matched up with the, uh, gun that killed Carlo. Any connection other than the bullets? 
Yeah, last night's victim worked for a paper manufacturer who has a contract to supply banknote stock to the government. Well, the paper's no good to him without the plates. Which means they'll be coming after him. Can't you just arrest them? As a matter of fact, there are federal agents on the way to that club right now. You and I are going to meet them there. Do you want my help? Jack, why don't you just uh, stay and take care of the baby? We'll try to get along without you. Pete doesn't mess around. Pete follows his own advice, which is to never do anything with Jack Dalton. Right. So the cops head to the club, and Cutler and Durst are hiding in their secret room where their printing is as the cops toss the place. Back at the houseboat, Jack is kind of warming up to the idea of being a father, and he's getting a little wistful about it, and he's trying to remember, hey, Katie, I was drunk. Was I too drunk to remember us being together? You know how sometimes I like to retrofit a holiday, one of these episodes, into a current holiday that me and you are living through? Oh, you know what's on Sunday. Oh, yeah. Well, it's Father's Day. Father's Day. Perfect. Yep. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I missed the obvious with Father's Day. But you know where my mind went after seeing Mac and Jack and with Jack Jr. there? And they both have this like semi-touching, vulnerable moment. And Jack has this twinkle, this gleam in his eye as he's talking to Mac, looking at this boy. And I thought this could be our Pride Month episode. But no, it should probably just be the Father's Day episode. <laughs> yeah, I think that's going to I'm better. telling you, that's going to be, I think I'm going to dust off the uh, great moments in uh, promos, and it's going to be great moments in uh, celebrating Pride, and it's going to be a eight-second cut of Jack talking to Mac with his gleam in his eye, looking at this baby and being like, hey, did you ever want kids? Do you? And hey, and then he says, he says, Mac, will you marry me? Will you marry me? Cut. I'm going to cut it there. Great moments in Pride. Way to go, MacGyver. Way to, way yep. to go, Henry Winkler, pushing the envelope back in 1988. Yep, they really did. I mean, Jack straight up proposes. I, I think Mac is right to not marry him. He brushes him, it off. That's not a... If it, well, wouldn't you? <laughs> I'd brush off the mustache first, and then I'd think about it. But if <laughs> Mac was giving back to Jack the kind of look that Jack was giving to Mac, which is oh, yeah. like, would, you're a snack, Mac. That's the look Jack is giving to Mac. It would be saxophone fade to black moment. Yes. And I would have. It would be. There would be. We would cut back, and there would be lizards on the table, freshly cooked <laughs> lizards. I mean, we both know they. So Jack has confirmed he has been with women. So we know he's heterosexual. Mac has been with women, heterosexual. But these two spend a lot of time together in some tight quarters. Mm -hmm. And here we are with a child in between them, and Jack is kind of like saying. I don't know, it seems pretty good right here. You and me and a kid, let's do this, you know? I mean, like, <laughs> this is probably the most homoerotic moment I think maybe the series will see right here. So just savor it, everyone, well, Pride Month. <laughs> well, I, I, I've got bad news for not oh. only you, but also for Jack, because the kid ain't his. He's not your child, Jack. <laughs> He's Carlos. Oh. But I did name him after you because... I knew that he would have your kindness, your laugh, your love. Well, right now he needs changing. I think it's mommy's turn. Jack, I'm sorry if I made you think that... No apology necessary? Hey, it's Jack Dalton, the Mad Rover, remember? I can't have any little ankle biter tying me down. Shoot, I can't even keep a goldfish. She was a babe. Mitzi Capture, the name, and looks familiar. Mitzi Capture, I think she's still working. Yeah, she captured my attention. <laughs> um, I get a couple things there in that very long clip. Um, so the guy that got shot, his name was Carlo. And so she said, but I thought maybe it was Carlos. But when you said the baby was Carlos, that works. But if it was Car the guy's name was Carlos, it would be, it w he was Carlos's, yeah. right? Yeah. Not just a <laughs> That's what you're focused on? You're not focusing on the fact that Carlo let his girl name his baby after some other man? <laughs> Maybe she showed him a picture of the mustache. He's like, come on, look at this stash. Carlo, I know it's yours. Wait, first of all, is this even legal? Are you legally allowed to give someone the junior name if they're not a junior? Don't you have to be? Ooh. Is it the junior, like, if one of my sons were, we named him Jeff, he would be Jeff Jr.? Like, you can't just, I mean, I'm sure there are, like, laws against what you can name your, like... Surely there is a, like a department or a bureau somewhere at the government that keeps track of this kind of thing. Gee, that's neat. Is this, I don't know all women, but I don't know if I've ever heard a woman say that she was going to name her kid after another man that wasn't, because she knows he's going to have 
Jack's good qualities. Why would he have Jack's qualities? He's not Jack's kid. This doesn't make any <laughs> sense. I don't understand it at all. It would make so much more sense. She's like, yeah, actually, I just need it's Carlo Jr. I needed you to look after him, and I thought calling him Jack Jr. would make that possible. Like, okay. I guess it's just me that's hung up on this. At the, no, it's, there's a lot of beef to be had in this episode, and it's, it's fun picking through it. It's clearly, like, I mean, this is... The only thing that's tight about the writing is the fact that they make note of the paper at the beginning of the episode and the paper pays off later. The rest of it is just like very hairy episode. They're at the club. The cops are turning the place over. Jack and Mac, or I'm sorry, Mac and Pete show up. Uh, Mac being very uh, observant notices that the room is not the right size and that the mirrored wall is unusual. And so he flips the light off. And that's when you see Cutler and Durst on the other side. They raise the shotgun Mac dives to save Pete from the shotgun blast, and the two of them lift a couch and charge Cutler and Durst, who fire a shotgun blast into the bottom of the couch, and then knock them bodily out of the upstairs office where they had been um, overseeing their club. And that is the end of Axminster 4, as, the, as Cutler and Durst find themselves under arrest. And then there's a there's a somewhat longish Axminster 5, um, and this cut is a little bit girthy. So uh, if you want to just go ahead and start Perfect. it, this is the wrap Perfect up with Katie. Month. Jack tries to get her to stay, but she's not having any of it. Why don't I take you on a tour of Dalton Air? I'll show you what I mean. They'll take care of the baby. Here, I got him. You bet. You bet. I got him. I got him. I got him. Forget about it. Are you sure you don't mind? No way. Hey, maybe I'll even throw in dinner. Just don't get me started on the mezcal. Oh, stop. Uh, Mac, can I use your Jeep? My caddy's in the shop. Yeah, keys are on the wall. Thanks. the guys, huh, J.J.? You know, I never thought of you as the paternal type. Pete, this has nothing to do with fatherhood. I happen to know talent when I see it. Oh. How about a goal? Oh, yeah, yeah, here. How's that? He's a rookie. Open it up. Uh, all right, the puck, the puck. No. Face off at some race. All right, go get it, kid. Go get Shoot. It. And he scores! Unbelievable! He's wide open! The future of amateur hockey in the United States. <laughs> And that's Rock the Cradle. <laughs> Mac, single-minded about the hockey. Goodness gracious. Uh, I know. Stop trying to cram hockey into everything, Richard. <laughs> Name's MacGyver. Hit me, Jeff. Uh, this sucks. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, like The plot is kind of boring and meandering. The whole surprise kid thing doesn't really work for a whole bunch of reasons, not the least of which is what I think are some ad-libbing about all the alcohol by... Uh, Bruce McGill and stuff like that. <laughs> Don't give a crap at all about the counterfeit goods. Don't give much of a crap about the lady who just is willing to drop her baby off with just any random person. Um, it There's not much here to keep you in it. Uh, opening with yeah. the plane is very cool. I thought, all right, they're on a good track here. They got a great stunt going. And then it just kind of falls off after that. Uh, I like Mac and baby episodes because we've had a Mac and pregnant lady episode before. So... It's not the baby's fault. I absolve the baby of anything that's coming, but this is a four mullet affair. We make it on the bottom third of the season easily. I was ready to hear you drop a three, and then I was going to drop my four to a three, but you kept at a four, so I'll keep my four. Uh, yeah, I've got a problem going back to back jacks. You can't do that. You, you lessen the impact of jack. And... Um, that's a that's an instant point to, you know that's an instant two points off this episode in my opinion no how no matter how good it's gonna get I we just had Jack in the mask of the wolf so um and it's just weird it's just uh, I don't know off putting it's I guess it's a cute premise and maybe it was again inspired by the current movie of the month right like two men three men and a baby or three men and a little lady whatever it was right Ted Danson we talked about that that movie probably just came out six months ago the writer said give me that do that in a forty five minute episode um. The plane thing is kind of cool, I guess, but I don't like, you know, that's almost like an opening gambit, but I didn't feel the motivation for them to be in peril so early in the episode. And it just seemed like, well, they just made a mistake. 
There's not, there's no one going after him. It's just Jack's incompetence is why Mac has to save the day. Otherwise he's going to die. So no, um, doesn't do it for me. Not a good episode. It's a below average episode. I've got four mullets out of 10. Forgettable. I mean, it just files, falls in the, in the pile of blah. Not even bad enough to be memorably bad. It's not an Eagles. It's not a Trumbo's world. Yeah. It's just, you know, and some of that is, I mean, like to Bruce McGill's credit, like he is very entertaining. It's pretty easy to see like where a lot of his like skill and charisma come get brought into it. I could see why you'd bring him back, but it's just too much. And the, the Jack plus one had went to a Jack plus zero. It might be moving to a Jack minus one. I'm telling you. And we, we like Bruce McGill as a, as a person from what we know of him because he's been friendly with us to the show and, and Mike, of course, Mike, and he is very talented. I mean, we've, we've gushed over him before. So please, listeners, differentiate what we're saying here. We are not saying the Jack Dalton character isn't great. He is. We're not saying Bruce McGill isn't great. He is. However, you got to do it in moderation. You got to do it in moderation with the right script and with the right plot. And he was not being served that here. It does make me want to watch a couple episodes of the new series, of which I've still never seen an episode. Because they, ha- Jack Dalton is then like a permanent fixture of the cast in that. But he's been transformed from like bumbling buffoon into like booted and suited, jacked up ex-military, bald head, tough guy. And I'd be interested to see like the different take on Jack Dalton. Because he just can't have a recurring character that's constantly the source of problem. Right. And it, it's MacGyver being frustrated and dragged into schemes and plots is an old plot device. This is already... Very old at this point. You could do it once a season, twice a season, maybe. Can't do it five times in a season. It loses its appeal. Uh, a couple other notes here. Bruce McGill plays throat music for the baby. And he does the same trick in his most famous movie role, D-Day, in Animal House. Oh. So if we had Mike here, I'm sure he would have remembered that he does the same thing in Animal House. And uh, Garwin Sanford Durst, one of the counterfeiters, later went on to appear in several Stargate SG-1 episodes as Narim. 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 A little another Once little again, Stargate MacGyver connection. So many people going from MacGyver to Stargate. Uh, to Stargate. Um, so I give a four. You give a four. Add it up. Divided by two, and that gives us five. This one's rated four out of ten. Right, Mullets. So it's a four for Rock the Cradle. Yep. Let's uh, crunch the numbers. Takes a second. What was he one for one on the MacGyver? One for one. Batting a thousand. How many times did someone say MacGyver here? This feels low. Eight. Oh, my God, Jeff. Did I get it right? You nailed it. Hey! Let's stop this. Let's stop this Happy, happy, joy, joy. (laughs) I don't keep track of this when I'm watching, and I don't make a point of, like, paying attention to it. I just, like, I just watched. I got my own thing going on. I got my own business that I got to handle when I'm watching these episodes. But while I was watching, I remember the strong admonishment that I got last week about not to fall for the Mac MacGyver trap. So unfortunately, because the last three episodes, they've only said it a total of 16 times, back to back fours, which is tied for the lowest and now eight here, it has brought down the season average of how many times MacGyver is mentioned in episode to 18.7. Now that's still... That is still higher than the previous two seasons, which were 15.5 and 15.9. But that's just to tell you how strong the season's been. But wow, they're, they're really slowing down here. I would not have Partly guessed. because Jack is in. Yeah, they're running out of gas. It's, it's pretty clear. I mean, they don't bring mm-hmm. Jack in back to back unless you're like really struggling. True, um, true. But like it is, to your point, exactly about the quality of the season. I would never have guessed that the MacGyvers were more frequent in this season than in previous seasons. Right, right. Um, how about the most make fun of moment? As you said, we've got a lot to choose from here. Remote control plane. Baby Rube Everyone Goldberg. Everyone changing a diaper. I'm going with the Rube Goldberg baby machine because I, I laughed out loud in my living room watching that. And I went back to watch it. I watched the episode twice. But even though I do that, I went back and watch it again. I'm like, how did this baby do this? It's very funny. And like cards shoot out of the Rolodex and knock over the beer. It's so crazy. All right. I'll go with that. I'll go with that. And... Um, That'll put the wraps on this one. You know, this is why we do this show, because sometimes you get a really fun, enjoyable episode of 80s television, and a bunch of times you don't, but then we get a great episode to make each other laugh and just poke fun at. Well, these mediocre episodes are a little easier to take shots at, 
Because if it's good, yes. I sometimes feel a little like this is a good episode. I shouldn't shit on it. And then right. then you get something like this. It's like, yeah, give me a new diaper. I'm about to fill this one up. Oh, that's a doorbell. Um, I'll go get it. Hang on. Better not be Jack Dalton. Oh, my God. Jeff, look down at the ground. It's it's Jack Jr. Oh, my gosh. Why is he still a baby? <laughs> I don't know. Why is he still? I don't know. But we shouldn't he be in his like 40s? You would think so, but we've had this happen before where characters visit us from MacGyver yeah. and they're still the same age. And look at this little kind little guy. Hey, it's okay. I Hey, stand back. I have the experienced father here. I have two children. I have a four-year-old and a one-year-old. I'm oh. I'm ready for this. Oh, yeah. He looks Let's like he's still about with... one. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, well, somebody put a duct tape diaper on him? Is that how that Can goes? we take that off? Let's. Maybe we should take that off. It looks uncomfortable. Yeah. Oh, boy. No, put it back. Oh, boy. Put no, back. put it back. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> put boy. it back. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, Actually, well, also, let's put some pantyhose on it. Put some leg yeah, support yeah. on it. <laughs> I just happen to have some laying around. They're really cheap these days. How do you deal with crying babies? I've never had one. but how uh, I usually just give them to my wife. Well, now it's just me and you. What are we going to do with this thing? Uh, I mean, we have chips and beer. Jack brought that over earlier. Ooh, nice. You know, I, I've been told that that calms them down if you give them enough. Let me, uh, let me make a silly face. That looks just like your regular face. <laughs> uh, wait, let me, let me show him this. Let me show him. Maybe let's make him stop crying. Hey, look at this. It's a picture of Mike Garland. Oh, oh no. That's making no, it worse. No, no. no <laughs> that's making it worse. No, no. Wait, don't you have keys? Jingle some keys. Jingle some keys? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. See, the keys always work. Oh, he's such a cutie. Hey, Jeff? And he stinks. Yeah? Jeff? Uh, do, you, do you hear that noise out there? Do you see something off in the distance? Uh, are you not blending a smoothie? You see that? It's coming co closer. The, the, oh my gosh! Oh, that's loud. That that looks like a remote control plane. Do you see that like thing that's coming? That's definitely a remote control plane. We we should run and hide. This thing is coming. It's heading for the baby. It's oh no! For the baby, Jeff. Wait, but it's not headed for me, right? Got Junior, look out! No! Wow, that's one smoldering baby. That's very sad. Any other final thoughts here, Jeff? No, that's all. Uh, there's two episodes left. They can't all be this bad. <laughs> Daggering to the finish line. Uh, thank you for your yep. fine effort here today. A quick thanks uh, to our Patreon patrons. A gracious hat tip to them, Bo in Florida, who reminds us that uh, making people laugh and smile goes a long way. We have Claire in New Jersey. If you love deep dives into classic TVs from a feminist perspective point of view, there's only one place in the world you need to go, and that's to deadfictionalgirlfriendreports.com. Uh, Christian in Norway, who has taught us about the land of his fair country, Stavik Football, Osbeer, and of course, one of the all-time great bands, Aha! And Simon in Sweden, who thinks Trumbo's World. 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 It's one of the best episodes of MacGyver ever, which, I mean, it's hard to argue that because we talk about it almost every time, <laughs> including like five <laughs> or six times today. We thank you for listening here today. We're always looking for new friends on social media, so feel free to reach out to us there, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. But above all else, keep coming back because we are going to keep making fun of MacGyver. So for Jeff, I'm Sam, and thanks again. We'll see you next time. Peace. Papa was alone the snow. We met at the officer's club. She plied me with mezcal. It lasted about a week. It was well over a year ago. I don't even remember if I had a good time. Look, this is a problem for social services. Let, let the police find the mother. It's not our problem. Papa was alone in stone. your child, Jack.